Thank you, Dee. This is Joelle Fishman. I want to thank you for um, taking the initiative to put this important discussion together. Um, I serve as the chair of the Political Action Commission for the Communist Party, and I'm based here in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm the chair of the Communist Party in Connecticut. So I'm going to be starting off. Um, the horrors of Charlottesville have brought into sharp relief the question of how to effectively resist the provocations of emboldened white supremacist Nazi and anti-immigrant organizations. What kind of resistance will inspire the largest cross-section of people to engage? What tactics will create the majority needed to win? The context is the incitement to racism and bigotry by this president and his administration, which has emboldened hate groups and domestic terrorism. Days after Charlottesville, uh, Trump pardoned Sheriff jo Joe Arpaio, who had lost his election and was found guilty of racial profiling. This pardon gives a further green light to terrorizing immigrant families and all communities of color. The KKK white supremacist and Nazi groups armed with military style weapons are the shock troops meant to distract and divide the people while civil rights, voting rights, labor rights, and all democratic protections are dismantled. The tactic of these groups is to descend on communities, especially progressive and college communities, instigate a fight, create turmoil, get headlines, chill the political atmosphere, and open the way for repressive measures. They use these events to train what they hope will be an organized mass fascist movement. The question we're addressing is what are the tactics that will give clear leadership and engage the vast majority of people to defend democratic rights and justice. Fighting on their false terms, as for example the Black Bloc has done, essentially gives in to the provocation and plays into the supremacist hands. It allows media to take the focus off the supremacists. It allows agent provocateurs an easy entry. It scares some people away who would otherwise participate and confuses others. It does not show confidence in the working class to resist. It is dangerous for our party. History shows that provocations can be overcome with large-scale tactics that bring people together in unity across race, gender, and religious lines. Racism, white supremacy, and bigotry hurts everyone. They are not simply personal attitudes. They are systemic, built into our nation's capitalist structure from its beginnings and from slavery onward. These poisons have been used to rationalize slavery, segregation, terror, voter suppression, mass incarceration, deportation, and war. They have been the central tool for dividing working class people and weakening our ability to win racial and economic equality, workers' rights, social justice, and peace. There are ways to reject the Klan provocation and at the same time take a clear stand against racism and for unity. One model is what the civil rights movement did through civil disobedience in the 1960s. Under the leadership of Martin Luther King Jr., they took the moral high ground and won the conscience of the nation to oppose the terror of Jim Crow segregation. This resulted in the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and much more that is in danger of being dismantled today. Today, the fact that millions of people are ready to act was shown in the outpouring of protests against white supremacy and domestic terrorism after Charlottesville. Across the country, and frankly around the world, peaceful vigils, public expressions by elected officials, clergy, unions, and community groups took place in rural towns and in large cities. In Boston, 40,000 marched peacefully the small supremacist so-called free speech gathering ended early and canceled several planned rallies around the country that were to follow. In San Francisco, the longshore workers have voted to stop work and participate in rallies if white supremacists come to town. I participated in two very large phone conference calls initiated by different national groups after Charlottesville. In the first call, two options were referenced as having been considered in Charlottesville 
uh, by the activists uh, to protest the Unite the Right rallies. One option was confronting the fascist elements directly, including possible physical force. The other was choosing to ignore the supremacist in hopes they would go away. Framed that way, the first option was chosen, but it is a false choice. There are other significant options and ways to resist and reject the supremacists and challenge systemic racism. As communists, our starting point has to be building the largest possible united front. Our broad coalition approach was actually developed in the struggle against fascism. In any given situation, we search for tactics that can bring whole communities together in opposition to the provocations and ideology of the Klan and Nazi elements. We search for tactics that are not limited to marching in the moment, but that also strengthen ongoing organizing and voter participation. A couple examples. One example is in a rural community in the Midwest. When white supremacists announced they would hold a rally, Jungian folks decided they wanted to do more than march. In addition to march, they wanted to build a lasting opposition to racism and hate. So they asked their elected officials, their clergy, their educators to issue strong statements and hold discussions with their constituencies ahead of time. That's in process. So far, the supremacist rally has been postponed. Another example is on the island of Innelhaven in Maine. Lots of Confederate flags showed up on trucks. Our comrades report, quote, down due to persuasion. The people who had the flags up now agree to keep them off their trucks, end quote. The persuasion included a bit of history about Maine's important role in winning the Civil War against the treasonous Confederacy. After Charlottesville, 65 people turned out to two vigils in this tiny community. I live in New Haven, Connecticut. We have a progressive African-American woman mayor, Tony Harp, and a board of alders that includes many union leaders who have been elected from their wards. One day, a white supremacist group, the Proud Boys, showed up. Word had gotten out, and some groups headed down with paint guns and other things. The Proud Boys only had a couple people to hear a speaker who never showed, whose talk was called Resist Socialism. A melee ensued, and the Proud Boys got the headlines they wanted. Comrade Jamal Henderson and I had a letter published in the local paper in the name of our Communist Party club, and I thought I'd quote the last several sentences. New Haven is a target because this movement is organizing and educating people and bringing them into action against racism and hate and for equality. Hate groups use fear of dreaming big to keep people from searching for basic solutions. The theme resist socialism is a fear tactic to stop people from imagining how our country could be organized for the benefit of everyone, not just the billionaires. Martin Luther King warned of the urgency of now. Today's urgency is to resist the Trump extremist agenda, to dream big and build an expansive and inclusive movement beyond capitalism, racism, and exploitation to achieve basic human needs for all. That's the end of that quote, and the letter was very well received. After Charlottesville, the mayor held a press conference with her excuse me, her staff, the police chief, clergy, and community, reaffirming that New Haven will remain a welcoming city, a sanctuary city, and a city that rejects white supremacy and hate. As communists, we search for tactics that can win concrete policies to undo structural and institutional racism in every aspect of life. In North Carolina, Reverend William Barber said, quote, pull down the statutes not just the statues. One way to resist is to participate with the poor people's campaign he is organizing, picking up where Martin Luther King Jr. left off when he was murdered. The second national phone conference I attended opened with remarks by Wes Bellamy, the vice mayor of Charlottesville. He cautioned that it's not correct to say that Charlottesville was chosen for the Unite the Right rally only because of the move to take down the statue of Robert E. Lee. A reparations bill had unanimously passed city council, allocating $4 million for parks, schools, and jobs in the African-American community. 
So this contributed to the targeting of Charlottesville. And Charlottesville is in Virginia, where an important governor race is underway, which is coveted by the Republicans, and an important test coming into 2018. The choice of Charlottesville as a target was a warning to other mun municipalities. Don't dare become a welcoming city, a sanctuary city, a city that pr practices equity. But more and more mayors are responding to grassroots organizing and publicly refusing to be intimidated or bullied. At the Labor Council Hall in the Haven, Senator, U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal said he's spending time campaigning with Mayor Tony Harp because he believes that she, if she's reelected with a landslide, it will send a signal to the nation that the people support the city's sanctuary status and rejection of white supremacy. This election year, and especially the 2018 elections, are critical to give a resounding defeat to the move toward fascism. A focal point of resistance is organizing that voter turnout starting now. What tactics, what kind of resistance is needed to defeat white supremacy and fascism and advance democratic rights and justice? As communists, we are guided by what will reach out to the most people, what will influence the most people and build unity, and what will organize the most people. Thanks. I think the net, the, I'm turning the floor over um, to Joe Sims. Thank you, Joelle, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, well, you already know my name is Joe. Um, I live in New York City, and uh, I'm on the national board of the Communist Party. Um, I want to say thanks to the uh, organizers of this event. Very, very happy to be here. And I just want to amplify on a few of the points that uh, Joel raised and perhaps raise a few other questions. Um, this issue of, of, of how to respond to uh, white supremacy and the fascist danger um, is uh, lurking behind it is being discussed all over the country. Um, it's being discussed at the dinner table. Um, it's being discussed at um, bars. Um, it's being discussed at uh, breakfast. People, people are, are asking, what's the best tactic for dealing with these forces? Is it confrontation? Is it ignoring them? Demonstrations? What? And at the risk of uh, seeming ridiculous and, and grossly uh, oversimplifying the issue, I'd like to say that the best tactic, in my view at least, can be summed up in one word. Uh, and that word is unity. Building the broadest possible unity to isolate the fascist element and push them back uh, against the fringe, in my view, is the key question that's before us this evening um, and will be with us for some time to come. This is particularly important, as Joel pointed out, after Trump's giving license um, uh, and comfort to these elements uh, with his remarks in Charlottesville and then uh, that gross uh, pardoning of Sheriff Joe out there in Arizona. Well, how do you build unity in this fight? In my view, there are several ways to approach it, but I, I feel like one of the first things that we should keep in mind is not to allow ourselves to become provoked. At this stage, the, the goal of the organized fascist fringe is to stage provocative actions with the aim of eliciting a response from the democratic movement against them. The, the, the violence of, of the rhetoric and actions they hope will be met by violence and rhetoric from ours. Um, because um, in most times, uh, these folks have the support of the police and other sections of the justice system. They bet on such responses uh, and, and the potential 
for regressive marriages that will be uh, dealt with on the left. So they do the provocation, we respond, uh, and then at the end of the day, we're the ones uh, who are being repressed because they have uh, support uh, in the police, in the legal system, in the judiciary, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's not black and white, of course, but uh, there is that element. So not being provoked is, in our view, very, very important. Secondly, building unity means building the movement on the broadest possible basis. And that means rejecting the attempt to frame this issue as one of uh, right versus left. Right versus left. No. This is not an issue of right versus left. This is an issue of the fascist-minded and racist fringe against the majority. Um, um, and demands and, and slogans have, in my view, to keep this in mind. Uh, that means that, that we should uh, take into account what is basic, you know, what is um, fundamental for us, what is a principal issue that cannot be compromised on, and what is secondary um, and open uh, to negotiation. That's important because the question will be asked, um, you want to make it broad, Joe, you want to make it broad, but won't that dilute the issue and open it up to being sidetracked uh, and hijacked? Um, and the answer is yes. That's always a danger. That's why it's important to know what your bottom line is and how you're going to deal with it uh, going forward. Um, this is important um, because I think that uh, um, we third, thirdly, we, we, we have to uh, be flexible um, uh, and creative in the use of our tactics. Um, and we have to use and have at our disposal, all of the tools in the toolbox, um, uh, boycotts, uh, well mentioned several of them, sit-ins, occupations, demonstrations, strikes, picket lines, petition drive, disruptions, you name it. When it comes to the issues that we uh, care most deeply about, um, it should not be about business as usual. Uh, particularly when it comes to the 1%, um, the ruling class, that 1% uh, that of the population that controls uh, uh, such a big percentage of the national uh, wealth. In this regard, we should think about who and where our protests are aimed at. In our opinion, uh, they should take aim at the ruling class whenever and wherever possible. You know, the genius of Occupy uh, was that it was aimed at Wall Street. And even the occupation of the park itself largely did not interfere with the working class and people on their way back and forth uh, to work. So holding rallies, demos, sit-ins, at corporate headquarters and in the offices of public officials um, um, is the way to go, you know? The bigger and more militant, the better. Um, nothing wrong with a little bit of militancy. In fact, nothing's wrong with a lot of militancy, so long as it is conducted in concert and in conjunction with masses of people in motion. You know, um, um, to uh, uh, confront the fascist right, one has to make a distinction between the fringe that is organized in groups and those uh, that they influence on the one side um, and um, on the other side, a huge mass of people um, who might be defined as, uh, with the expression, 
I am not a racist, but, you know, I am not a racist, but they make too many babies. Uh, I am not a racist, but those folks need to speak English, you know. Um, and I could go on down the list of racist stereotypes that these people amount. Um, in order to, to confront the fascist right, um, 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 tactics um, that would be applied to the first group, you know, the organized KKK friends, neo-Nazi friends, is different from those in that broader group. You know, I sought out the uh, opinion of, of an old civil rights worker in preparation for this discussion, and, and they made the point at this point strongly, that you got to distinguish between those two groups. Now, organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center kind of focus on um, uh, addressing that organized group by, um, by suits, you know, by keeping them off uh, center with, with, uh, uh, in the courts, you know, by exposés, you know, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, which is which is good and and are very very helpful, but with regard to that larger group of unaffiliated folks who have um, been moved and organized to take racist group actions, for example, like voting for Trump, the key issue is involving them in struggle around the bread and butter issues that affect them, you know, issues like health care. Um, jobs, um, the environment, uh, taxes, housing, uh, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. In other words, we have to find common ground with people where we can find common ground with them. This civil rights worker told me that in a few instances, when they were working in the Deep South, uh, there were coalitions built around such issues that included some people who were in the KKK. He said, I know for a fact that they were. Um, and still they were, some of them, not all of them, moved from racist to non-racist and in the best scenarios, anti-racist positions. But what about the uh, first group, those who are organized? What approach should we uh, take to them? There's a trend today who, who argues for direct confrontation uh, with these groups. And, um, and as Joel indicated, such an approach is brave and uh, it's courageous and, uh, and uh, we can admire it. Um, I remember that as a younger person, uh, the Black Panther Party were among my big admirers. You, you know, it stands out. Uh, they're taking on the police. Um, however, history suggests that it's not the way to go. Why? Because at the end of the day, in case after case, these tactics have resulted in the violence being blamed on us. And not only that, but the violence is used and is as an excuse for greater repression against everybody. You know, remember that phrase from the religious figure in Germany. First they came for the communists, um, and then they came for the trade unionists. And by the time they came for him, there was nobody left. But some might argue, you know, Joe, that's just, you know, come on, man. That's just wishy-washy liberalism. It didn't work before. It's not going to work now. You can't argue with these people, you know? One person sent in a letter to the PW and said just that. You can't, you can't, you can't reason with these people, and therefore you have to take another tack. Um, you have to go at them directly, and and, and of course, you know, I, I must admit there's an element of truth here, but I would take issue with the conclusion. First of all, it's not true. The tactics that were employed by the civil rights movement by King and others worked magnificently. They changed the whole debate uh, in the course of politics in the country. The racists were not completely defeated, but isolated. 
and the number of elected officials in the deep south, well, in the south throughout, went from, you know, you can count them on the left side of your left hand, they went from there to several thousand now. Um, so so the, uh, that's, you know, a victory that can't be uh, ignored. Um, um, but here's, here's, here's the thing. The tactics that we're suggesting aren't mild-mannered. And we understand that in some cases, um, with some of these elements, um, force and compulsion is necessary. But there is such a thing, comrades, as nonviolent force and nonviolent compulsion. A strike, for example, is by definition an act of force. Uh, peaceful, hopefully largely, though not always, uh, but it forces an end to the process of production. And with it, with the end of that process, everything that comes with it, all kinds of ramifications. But you're compelling something in that case. So too with certain types of sit-ins and boycotts. We are forcing an end to business as usual and simultaneously hitting them where it hurts um, in their pocketbooks. And at the end of the day, that is the only language that the ruling class really understands. And so it seems to uh, us that we have to begin to master these tactics. We have to use them creatively. We shouldn't be afraid to be uh, a militant, but we do so in concert with masses of people who are in motion, not tailing them, not standing too far in front of them, but in concert with them, helping to lead um, and uh, uh, isolating the uh, right uh, that way. And last but not least, let me just underline and put an exclamation point to the points that Joel raised with regard to the elections, because that is where in just a few months, the huge struggle is going to be undertaken to, to uh, 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 defeat the Tea Party and the other uh, uh, racist and fascist elements. And by the way, we should be part of that process. The Communist Party should, like some other groups are doing, field candidates. And that's a discussion that we need to have, that we need to have soon. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Mike Rubitz. Uh, I'm a retired uh, industrial worker. As a worker, I spent 42 years in industry. Uh, six years, my last six years, as president of a large basic steel local in Ohio. Uh, I really like the comments by Joel and Joe, and I agree with them. They're, they give a good overall look. My experience has been a little more personal and a little more uh, directly dealing with people. Uh, first of all, to me, uh, whether you're dealing with scabs, Nazis, or uh, KKK members, uh, you're not trying to win them. You're not trying to argue with them. What you're trying to do is win other people to supporting what you're doing and to isolating them. Uh, to say that you're going to be able to argue with a, a Nazi is ridiculous. It just doesn't work. So your tactics reflect that. Your tactics reflect how you conduct yourself and the kind of things that you move. And I think Joe and, and, and uh, Joel have really made the point that mass numbers of people moving is the best way to do that. When Boston had that huge demonstration afterwards against the Nazis and the Klan, that shut them down there. And the same thing in San Francisco when they did the uh, putting dog poop out on the beach and, and in a nonviolent but very aggressive way went after them. Again, they backed off and did not have that. The right uses violence as a tactic to consolidate their support and then to make the left look like they're the ones that are the violent one. You look at what happened in Germany. 
you know, time and time again. There were all kinds of confrontations with the Nazis, but they came out on top. And their theme after that was we have to stop the violent left. And I noticed that Trump now is talking about law and order after he just uh, uh, pardoned Arapao. Uh, he then says, well, I want to be law and order. Well, that's a contradiction. But the point is, is that he wants to use the theme of law and order to come down on the left. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think the other thing is, is that, you know, when you look at violence and how there's your own personal self, uh, you know, I was in Mississippi in 1964, and I arrived there the week that Cheney, Swerner, and Goodman were killed. And one of the things that came through real clear to me was that when I was engaged in some kind of action where it was public and where we were representing the civil rights movement, you had to be nonviolent, no matter what the provocations were, because the balance of forces was clearly against you. At the same time, I came to the conclusion that if I was in some back street, and somebody jumped on me or the Nazis came after me or the Klan came after me down there, I wasn't going to go down without a fight. I'm, I'm not nonviolent in that sense. I believe that there is a time when you have to defend yourself and when circumstances are right, that you can have a, a, a balance of forces where you, you are able to defend yourself much more aggressively. But that's a tactic. That's something that you look at. And I always remember, I, I was uh, involved in negotiating a contract many years ago, and uh, I was just one of many people that involved in it. And we had a big meeting of some 500 people, and I was walking out of the, walking into the hall, and somebody cold cocked me. Boom, just like that. And I was decked and down on the ground. And I could have jumped up and started fighting with him. But instead, I moved past him while I got up and moved past him and went to address the meeting. If I would have started fighting with him, the focus would have been on the fight rather than the meeting. And any time you're dealing with those kind of situations, you have to look at what your personal, uh, what, what you do, your actions, whether they're going to keep the issue on, on what you're trying to do or whether the, the violence that you're involved in, if you got into it, would detract from that. And I think that's a very important thing, the question of discipline, knowing where you're going, uh, and being able to carry that out. You know, the other thing is, is when you're dealing, uh, I have lots, many, many years of dealing with a lot of workers, uh, white and black, and one of the things that, that I've found is, is that when you're dealing with workers, they want respect. And so when you deal with the issues involving work, workers, you deal with the issue of respect and dignity for people. And when you're dealing with racism, you've got to deal with the respect that black folks should have as workers and people. And to convey that to other white workers. Uh, it's a very important thing because it resonates with them. They understand when folks are disrespected. And that carries over. And by being able to reach out on that. The other thing is, is that when you're dealing with union folks, there's some folks that support the union. And you got they may be racist in the things that they do, but they will you can win them to dealing with racism because you can show that that disrupts the unity in the union. And the reality is, is that in order to have the union stronger, you have to uh, have unity with folks. Uh, tied to that, and I, I really don't think it's talked about enough, fundamentally, white workers do not benefit from racism. Their economic situation is made worse by it. All you got to do look, is look at the South and the huge wage disparity at the inability of unions to get organized down there. And that's fundamentally premised on racism. The, the racism is used to elect officials down there. Racism is used to disrupt unions. 
it, it is used to break up the unity of black and brown and white workers. And that has to be seen. And workers respond to the issue of unity. They know that. When you're involved in a strike, everybody realizes they got to work together. And I think those are important lessons. When, when Joe talked about the broadest unity of people, that's what you need in order to be able to uh, fight racism and the Klan. Uh, we have to strip them down and show that they're a very small minority of people. Very, very small. And the organized section of that is even smaller. And we don't need to give them the dignity of considering them uh, uh, arguable, that we can argue with them. You can't do that. They, they're not worth it. Okay, thank you for, for, for listening. I'll, I'll stop now. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, now we will open the floor for discussion to all participants. If you'd like to uh, speak, uh, if you'd like to join in the discussion, just click your raised hand icon and we'll know uh, you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question. So just click your raised hand icon and we will open your mic. Darren Foster, your mic is open. Thank you for this time. Very informative presentation. Uh, you have helped me to uh, rethink my position on confrontation. Uh, the nonviolent approach is the way to go. Uh, I don't see any profit in shouting back and forth, as we saw repeatedly from Charlottesville. Uh, because nobody's listening at that point. I'm a nurse. I work in psych, so trust me, I know. Uh, the thing I can recommend is, you know, I read Mein Kampf. Hitler outlined what he was going to do. He said, if with the wars, if another war starts, the Jews will will be uh, annihilated. They will they will be punished for this. Just the same, I recommend the Turner Diaries. I forget who wrote it. It's, it's some racist who wrote it. I read it. I was disgusted, but we have to know our enemy. And the Turner Diaries uh, is actually, they're doing, what they're trying to do is provoke us on the left to engage, to start screaming back and forth, uh, throwing metal news boxes at people. I saw that clip repeatedly. Um, and uh, we cannot be doing that because this is exactly what the Turner Diaries, Richard Spencer and uh, David Duke want. Um, and then we're blamed for it. And just like uh, a communist was blamed for the uh, Reichstag fire, the, the poor man, he was mentally challenged, he was a communist. The communists are, uh, well, the Jews are usually the number one scapegoat, but we communists are usually uh, running in a close second. And that's my comments. Thank you, uh, Darren. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce your name correctly, but Duran Zamatis. Zamatis. Yeah, okay. nobody pronounces it correctly. But anyway, um, I feel um, we we're talk. So I'm listening to this webinar. We're talking about a lot about the utility of nonviolence, and I largely agree. Like it's from not only just a tactical standpoint, but I think we've moved. Like we. As communists have developed more of a understa uh, historical understanding that whenever possible, we want to maintain the institutions of civil society. We want to maintain a sense of the rule of law. Like we're less about like you know just having this radical break with with the existing in liberal democratic institutions. Am I correct? Would I be um, accurate in saying this? Make your point, and we're, we're, we're going to have a number okay. of different, yeah. Okay, okay, so anyway, um, I think a problem is that, like, other other segments of the left feel like um, this this more nuanced viewpoint emphasizing nonviolence makes of some sort of sellouts. Um, they will... Um, 
they will kind of romanticize the idea of physically fighting Nazis, even though it's not always the best tactic. So how can we better work with other segments of the left to basically improve our tactical outlook in terms of standing up to white supremacy? Also, uh, also I would say um, how, um, how do we um, get across the idea to a lot of those white workers, especially in the South, that the racist, the white, the white supremacist system, it actually isn't in their interest. They may perceive it to be in their interest because it appeals to their identity, but when we talk about their material interest, it's not helping them. Um, and you say you pronounce your first name Darren? Yes. Okay. Anything else? That would be it for now. Thank you. Denise? Yes? Can I respond briefly to Darren's question? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for the question, Darren. Hey, look, man, we want a radical break. We want it as soon as possible. If we could do it yesterday, we'd do it yesterday. The question is how do we get from where we are to where we want to go? And in order to do that, we need a much, much bigger, much stronger, uh, much more um, movement with much more stamina and influence and, and so on. So we have to build. In fact, we're having a conference uh, in just a couple of weeks in November, a uh, party building conference that we hope for because we be face in, um, in, uh, in uh, growth. Um, and um, the, the, the point, though, is that we can't do this by ourselves, you know. Um, the question of where we're going, we, we, we want to do it in concert with our allies and, and uh, we, our coalition partners, whether formal or informal. And we're part of a coalition that's emerging among some left groups that uh, are pursuing a a, what you might call an inside-outside strategy with regard to the Democratic Party. Um, and, um, and, and that's important um, as well, you know, those kinds of uh, alliances. Um, but you shouldn't think that, um, and no one should draw the conclusion that, that uh, we don't want to uh, Go to socialism tomorrow. Uh, the, the problem is, is that uh, to climb that mountain, we need, you know, uh, a whole lot of forces to bring uh, along uh, with us. The uh, employment of uh, nonviolent uh, tactics uh, will help shape, I think, the end goal that we're trying to uh, seek. Socialism, and it's important because one of the things that we learned from the history of uh, socialism experience in the 20th century is that we have to pay much more attention to argumentation, to convincing people of not taking what we call administrative measures uh, with regard to political issues, but constantly engaging, talking, discussing, trying to win people to uh, a better position. In the course of that dialogue, we change, they change, and uh, our understanding and our struggle grows deeper. So that's my attempt to answer your question. I, I'm glad you asked it, and uh, we hope you'll go down that road with us. Thanks, Denise. Yeah, can I say a couple words, too? Um, one of the things that I think that you got to realize is that working people are not in the position where they can always in, be involved in a violent confrontation without either losing a job, ending up in jail, losing some kind of things. They suffer from some of those things. The folks that are able to do that are usually middle class people with some kind of an income, some kind of a way that they can take those things on. Most working people look at, how am I going to deal with it? I've been involved in lots of strikes, and there's always a certain amount of violence in them, and people make those decisions. I don't want to lose my job. 
And that's something that when you're looking at tactics, you have to be real careful and real clear. If you want working people, you've got to deal with that. Now, that doesn't mean that working folks aren't uh, pretty violent at times. <laughs> I can testify to that. But that's not a successful way to get them involved. I liked what Joe said, that a strike is a forceful way. A boycott is a forceful way of dealing with things. Those are not passive actions. You can be an active, uh, taking on an active role in taking things on by being nonviolent. Sometimes nonviolent is an extremely uh, forceful action. And I think people need to see that. And, and there's lots of romanticism out there. You know, people want to kick butt and be somebody, uh, you know, show what a macho guy they are. That don't work very well. And I, well, I'll just stop. Thank you. Okay. Just a second. Mark, your line is open. Mark Maxey, your line is open. I am calling in from Oklahoma. Um, one of the groups that I found out about a year ago and have been following is called Surge, showing up for racial justice. If you do a Google search for the letters S-U-R-J, uh, you can find that. And I find, I agree with what y'all are saying. It, it's going to take us standing locked arm in arm with so many different groups so that we show a unified solidarity. That's the only way we're going to win this struggle. Uh, one group by itself can't do it, but collectively we can. And that's all I had to share. Thank you, Mark. Mike Madden, your line is open. Michek, Michek, Madden, your line is open. Okay. Mikey Tells, your line is open. Tell us, your line is open. Hi, how are you doing? Hello. Hello. Well, what what I seem to see is that people are skirting around the issue of black and brown nationalism, and that seems to be the case here. What we need to do is get up out of this thinking, this mentality of that that whites are going to give us something. You know what? Whites have never given us anything, and I'm sorry to 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 say things like that, but is that is that not the whole point of this conversation, whites have never given us anything. What we need to start doing is we need to start we need to start putting putting our money into into the economy of the black and brown man. And and that's sorry to say, but we need to, we need to keep we need to stop letting whites give us things because that's when that's when they say, well we just gave you that. You know, we have to stand up on our own two feet and take and take our own. We need to take our own abilities. Thank you. Let's see who else. I'll try. Mr. Madden, your your line is open. Your line is open. Okay. Carrie, I'm trying to just okay. Your line is open, Carrie. Hello, greetings from the strike line. Um, I'd like to put that little bit that the last caller. Um, not so much whites won't give us anything. It's the ruling class, the owning class. They never give anything. It's only I don't see it so much as whites, but. The ruling class never gives anything. We basically have to take back what is rightfully ours. But again, it's 
if you fall into the trap of using violence, uh, they use that against us every time. They're very good at causing, creating a crime, or co committing a crime, and then blaming the victims for it. And they set up all kinds of traps for us that way, even right here on this straight line. Um, that's it. How's the strike going, Kerry? Um, as of yesterday, 27 dealerships had set out of one. We are striking 130 dealerships. There are 1,940 of us. We have five scabs. 27 mm -hmm. dealers have signed a fair contract. Their unity is crumbling. Ours is standing strong. Great. Thank They're you. Week. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, Emil, I'm coming to you. Um, Emil, your line is open. Okay, thank you. First of all, three great presentations. Thank you so much to Joel and uh, Joe and, and Mike uh, for wise words and good conversation. Two things come up out of my own experience in the movement, which has uh, been quite long. First of all, I come from a time in which the activity of adjunct provocateurs was a very, very, very big problem for the left and the people's movements. And I can't say that that has disappeared. And one thing that those uh, provocateurs used to always do was to try and influence some people in the movement to quote unquote, move things to the higher level, which generally meant from intelligence to stupidity in terms of, of tactics. Uh, I don't know if I even wanted to say it, but I'll say it. When I was teaching at the University of Illinois in the 70s, six and maybe seven of my students got hard jail time. Hard jail time, decades in prison sentences of decades, because they got enticed into some of these adventuristic tactics. They themselves were not violent people but uh, they let, let themselves be involved in their whole romance of, of uh, uh, how can we call it, playing at revolution, and it was tragic, the results for them. And this has not stopped. We've seen it everywhere. We've seen, seen it mobilized against the Occupy movement. We've seen it mobilized against the immigrants' rights movement. Secondly, I work a lot with immigrants' rights, and I can guarantee that if you have a protest demonstration or activity in which any number of non-citizens, doesn't matter whether they have papers or not, are involved and it ends up with a violent skirmish and there are arrests. What is ha going to happen is that those people will be very lucky not to be deported. You and I can get arrested, as Mike quite correctly says, we may lose our jobs and whatnot, uh, all sorts of headaches when that happens to you. But if you're a non-citizen and you get arrested, uh, even if you're a legally, legal resident in this country, you're taking a strong risk that it will end up with you being deported, your family being broken up, and if you're arrested, deported to certain countries, your life in danger. So I've seen that happen. I've seen immigrants' rights protests in Chicago when uh, ultra-left groups showed up and wanted to uh, turn what was a peaceful demonstration in which there had been careful work talking to the police beforehand so that nothing untoward would happen and they want to go and start a physical fight with the police and uh, that that uh, that is extremely dangerous so I think it's very important that our party is warning everybody against the danger of these uh, adventuristic playing at revolution tactics thank you Thank you. Cameron, your mic is open. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention a couple. Uh, so in my experience, like uh, methods, in, I feel the ruling class uses to um, convince working people to um, adopt white supremacy as a viewpoint and in my experience, the growing up in a rural area, um, the um, 
the definitely I feel that the church is a big part of it, and that isn't meant to be an anti-religious statement. But uh, there are definitely networks of religious cir circles. But basically, it's a problem where you know there are lack of community centers, lack of places for people to find community, and the church is one of the only places. And that, that was something that really. And then uh, you know they have relationships with all kinds of right-wing money. Um, but uh, one idea that I had been thinking about for a while, maybe that the progressive movement could use to deal with that is establishing more relationships um, between, um, you know, churches in urban and black communities with churches, you know, with a similar perspective in uh, rural and white communities. So to break down some of the, the segregation. Um, and in general, I feel that um, the ruling class is very interested in breaking up society into as many tiny little pieces as possible and making people feel lonely and afraid. Um, and, uh, and actually, uh, this is, uh, you know, sort of related to the frag to the um, issues that we're talking about in terms of tactics, because a lot of these ultra left groups kind of want to have this, you know, um, there's like a proliferation of more and more tiny, tiny or left groups and it's not, it doesn't help the movement. Um, that was one thought. And then the other thought is, uh, with, you know, um, basically the huge employment in uh, military and police forces, that definitely influences a number of working people to, to adopt right by supremacist attitudes. And I feel that that's an area of organization that needs more focus is, is basically uh, like um, organizing soldiers as well as uh, uh, um, police union elections and, and uh, identifying um, people in those in departments that um, can actually lead their coworkers to have a, a, a more elevated perspective. Thank you. Well, let me just say, as far as the churches is concerned, um, it's a uh, interesting point, Cameron, in reference to um, uh, breaking down segregation in, in the churches in rural areas with relation with uh, urban areas. And I, I believe there are some, um, some things like that that are being uh, done in some places. Um, and also, um, uh, churches are now uh, coming together uh, in a new sanctuary movement um, to uh, support uh, uh, those who <coughs> families who immigrant families who are being ripped apart and uh, provide shelter. Um, and this is also bringing together churches of various denominations and locations. So I, I agree that that can be uh, an important aspect of breaking down um, uh, breaking down ideas of uh, white supremacy. Shirley, your mic is open. Shirley? Yes. Um, I'm so glad you guys had this discussion. My question is, is that I don't think I or we should be so focused on like the small little fringe groups like the Nazis who come out and march. The big concern is white supremacists who have respectability, who don't see themselves as white supremacists, but they enact white supremacist policies such as like Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan. I mean, they're, they weren't well, they weren't quick to call out those guys in Charlottesville. However, the only difference between them and those guys in Charlottesville is that those guys were just more raw and blatant and real and honest with how they felt. So um, how do we attack that type of white supremacy, the ones, again, that have respectability and are in positions of real power. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. I think we were trying to um, address that to a certain degree when we're talking about uh, building uh, broad unity around the issues uh, in our communities um, and taking on 
those such as uh, Mitch McConnell, those who, who do hold office in power, uh, to organize at the grassroots. And um, uh, for example, even the organizing at the grassroots around the um, issue of repeal of the Affordable Care Act, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed, it will have a disproportionate, disproportionate impact uh, on the uh, on people of color, women, disability, and children, and uh, the the uh, upsurge throughout the country actually prevented them from doing that, which was their main goal. So the 2018 elections are absolutely crucial, and we should approach elections not just from the point of personalities, but from the point of view of day-to-day -day organizing year-round uh, on the issues at hand and exposing and showing uh, how these policies uh, of white supremacy uh, hurt everyone. And I believe that we have a real uh, possibility. It's uh, quite a big responsibility coming up into the 2018 elections. And uh, hopefully uh, some important uh, gains can be made that way. Could I just Sorry. add on that? that, that did you want to go, Joe? I was going what, to open the mic up for a, oh, okay. a, a participant, but um, let's take I, one or I two just, more. But just, go on. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to say that, they, that, that that's like a left hand and a right hand. The, the, those people like McConnell and Ryan represent the more entrenched and overt power of capital in this country. They are much more there. At the same time, they encourage and aid and abet folks like the Nazis to do that. And, and they are in, you know, they work in co uh, co concert with each other. And, and so you shouldn't see them as just one uh, or as separate things, but as one part of an effort to move this country. And the, the, the right wing wants to take power. They want to take this country over and be able to put people in concentration camps and, and that anyone that disagrees with them. And we should not be confused that the effort of the Nazis and the KKK is part of that, the more open fist of it, whereas the McConnells give them backing. Sorry. Okay. Dan, your mic is open. Dan Wright. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, so um, I'm a uh, uh, progressive clergyman in Texas, and uh, I encourage uh, my congregation, I have for years, to uh, uh, take nonviolent action whenever we can. It's something I've noticed recently, and it bothers me a bit, is the media really loves to highlight when there is left violence in reaction to, uh, let's say, right wing counter protests. We saw something recently. Um, why should our uh, responses be when there's uh, violence that comes from the left? I haven't seen very many official statements of uh, nonviolence from socialist organizations. And uh, I feel like a statement, an official statement of some, some kind for nonviolence would, would go a long way. I found opposition when I've mentioned nonviolence to uh, uh, comrades in the line. Uh, but mostly I think that that comes sometimes from um, a fringe that uh, feels like we need to be violent, that we need to go out there and, and bust some heads. But I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. So my point would be, can we start thinking about having an official statement of nonviolence? That's all. Thanks. Okay, Dan is our last speaker. Thank you, Dan. And I'll turn it back over to each of the panelists to make closing, uh, brief closing uh, re remarks. We're a little over the hour. Joelle. Hi. Okay, thank you, Dee. Um, I don't have too much to say except that uh, this is an important discussion tonight. Um, it's a discussion that continues, as Joe says, People across the country and families and, and school and settings are, are talking about how do we uh, deal with this uh, situation that we confront. And um, I think it was uh, a very good conversation tonight. 
and some good suggestions that we can uh, take into hand. But mostly, I hope that the takeaway uh, from our time together this evening is um, thinking broad in terms of the broad united uh, people, thinking unity, um, and thinking coalition. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, it's been it's been a great uh, conversation. It's uh, beginning, and um, we'll uh, end it when Trump is impeached and the group around him is removed uh, from office and uh, power. Uh, the source of all of these problems, you know, is in the ruling class. And the person who spoke and, and said, don't pay so much attention to the KKK friends, but you need to discuss those respectable so-called, you know, it's a good point. The source is on high in the ruling class. That's where, that's where it comes from. Um, and um, we got a peek at that with regard to uh, Trump. They all knew what he was about. Some of them even said it. We knew what we knew how he was. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the Republicans have been cultivating and and um, watering uh, this racist uh, seed, which has grown into a plant, which has become a tree for the last 25, 30 years. Everybody knows that, you know. Uh, you know, contract on America, mandatory minimum sentencing, broken window policing, you know, consciously pitting one section of the working class against the other, um, black against brown, against white, against Asian. Uh, but we're not going for that. And by the way, you know, um, the struggles of working class African Americans and Latinos uh, is not identical to the oppression and exploitation that white workers feel, but there's a great deal that we uh, have in common. We have more in common than separates us. Um, and for us to be united, the special demands that that we face have to be addressed. Um, and that's addressed more in the spirit of cooperation and what we call internationalism uh, than uh, nationalism, while we respect the national pride and feeling of people of color for their oppressed uh, and exploited communities. We respect that very much. But now we have a situation where they're talking about white nationalism, whatever the heck that is, um, and uh, that uh, they're arguing that uh, white working class people feel like they're being exploited as a group, as an identity. But that's a trick. Um, and, and so I think that the uh, key here is to find black, white, brown, Asian, and white issues that unite us. Um, if Obamacare is repealed, you know, we're going to have hell to pay. You know, that's an issue that will unite us. And people are doing that kind of organizing in rural communities. And, and, uh, and uh, we need to expand that as much as possible. And that's the way we're going to begin to win over some of the people who are confused by Trump's demagogy. So it's a great beginning to a conversation. Uh, you can reach us and email us. You can go to the party's Facebook page and you can make a comment there about the conversation tonight. Um, you can go to the PW and write comment. We want to continue the dialogue, and we're ready to do so. 
So thanks, uh, D, for organizing it. And uh, good night and good luck to everybody who is participating. Uh, I, I think it was a very good discussion. I'm very pleased and happy that I was able to be part of it. Uh, one of the things that people always have to remember is that workers got a whole lot more in common than they do in separation. Unions were organized, the industrial unions were organized because immigrant workers, black workers, uh, brown workers, and nationality workers, and I say that because there was not this concept of white workers out there in the 30s. That's who organized the industrial unions. And the concept of white workers is something that has been artificially created in this country. Most folks in the 30s identified with their nationality, not with their color. And I think that's an important thing that people have to realize. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, each of the panelists. Uh, we pulled this together with very uh, short notice, and everybody's uh, lives are quite demanding. And uh, but yet uh, they uh, agreed and showed up and took the time to prepare. And I'd really uh, like to ex express uh, our appreciation on behalf of the National Education. Com Commission as well. I'd like to uh, um, express appreciation for everyone who took time out tonight to join in. So uh, as the panelists indicated, this is the start of a conversation. I think uh, uh, someone will probably take the initiative, will take the initiative to follow through on one of the recommendations, which, 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 uh, which is that uh, there be a statement about nonviolence. So uh, with that, uh, thank you again and have a great evening. Good night. Good night everyone.